In this video, we will demonstrate the recommended procedures for recording EEG and ERP with the Biosemi Active 2 system, including donning PPE, preparing consumable supplies, measuring for head cap size and position, applying the cap and electrodes, checking electrode contacts, monitoring signals, saving data, removing the cap and electrodes, washing and disinfecting. You can learn more about available PPE and recommended procedures for recording EEG in the time of COVID on our website as shown here. If you have the option to design or choose an optimal recording environment, there are a wide range of factors to consider, including size and shape of rooms, ventilation, lighting, access to a sink for cleaning caps and electrodes, access to a private bathroom or shower for subjects to clean up after the procedure, controlling background sound and light levels, electromagnetic shielding, and more. This topic is well beyond the scope of this video, and we hope to cover it separately in a later video. To streamline the process of setting up an EEG participant and to give yourself more freedom to focus on the participants' needs when they have just arrived, it is advisable to prepare your supplies in advance. If you're using our recommended Monoject one-piece syringes and Signagel, remove the plunger from the syringe and hold the gel tube firmly against the syringe as you squeeze to push gel in the back and air out the front. Fill at least one 10cc syringe for a 64-channel recording. You may want to put 5 cc's each in two syringes if you will have a helper. Dividing up the task of applying gel and inserting electrodes is a practical way to accelerate setup. Working solo, a skilled operator should be able to set up 64 channels in 10 minutes from start to finish. Using double-sided tape is a good way to hold the flat type active electrodes in place while you apply double-sided adhesives and gel. Remember to invert the electrodes on the tape in the order you want to apply them so that you don't need to inspect them. Just grab the next one and go. When possible, choose wood or plastic furniture for your lab, since any metal can exacerbate problems with induced interference from nearby powered devices. A sturdy wood table is recommended for the stimulus display, and a tall stool can be helpful during cap and electrode prep. We recommend a wooden low back chair without swivel or wheels for the participant during the experiment. Of course, you should have the AD box and battery on a rolling cart or cabinet nearby and ready to go, but be sure to keep it away from the location where you're working with gel to avoid getting gel into the input connectors. Water in the input connectors will dry out, but gel can be difficult to remove, so it's better to avoid this problem completely. You might consider covering the AD box with a cloth to minimize the chance of gel or other sources of moisture from getting into the connectors. Any items like response boxes that the participant will touch should either be covered so they can be kept clean or they should be disinfected thoroughly after the procedure. Of course, it is a good idea to test your recording computer and confirm that you have the necessary login and that there is free space to store the EEG data. Along these same lines, please consider testing to be sure that triggers are reaching the EEG system before your participant arrives. This is not something you want to do while the participant waits, and it's not something you want to overlook. The first time you do a complete study on a participant and realize that the trigger cable was not plugged in, you will wish you had made a habit of checking the trigger cable before each recording. When the participant arrives, you should be ready to go, having prepared your recording environment and supplies, but also wearing your PPE. The more prepared you are, the more you will be able to focus on your participant's needs. PPE for participants will vary from one lab to another. Whether to use anything beyond a face mask is fully up to you. You will see in the steps that follow, the face shield can get in the way of putting the cap on and measuring the head raising the question of whether to offer it at all, and if so, when to offer it. Remove glasses, hair ties, hair clips, and any other obstructions that will interfere with the cap. Long hair should be spread out evenly on the sides and back of the head. Thick or curly hair that cannot easily be spread out should be compressed when you measure the head so that the size of the cap you use is based on the size of the head, rather than the amount of hair. Choose a cap size with a stated range that puts the participant's head circumference right in the middle of the range. A cap that is too tight will make the participant uncomfortable, and a cap that is too loose will result in poor recording quality, since a loose cap will not hold the electrodes tightly against the scalp.
Nasian is the inflection point on the bridge of the nose, just between the eyes, and Inyan is either the peak of the bony bump near the base of the skull or just the base of the skull. The vertex, also known as CZ or CZ for you Canadians, is halfway between these two points at the top of the head. For example, if Nasian to Inyan measures 36 centimeters, then the vertex will be 18 centimeters from the Nasian. If you plan to apply electrodes at the mastoids or earlobes, be sure to do that before you place the cap on the head, especially if the participant has long hair. Once the cap is on the head, it holds the hair down and makes it difficult to clear a path to place electrodes around the ears. If you place flat type electrodes at the mastoids, it's important not to place them too high or too low. Too high will pick up temporalis muscle. Too low will pick up neck muscle. If the mastoids are your EEG reference, these large muscle signals can corrupt the EEG. At this point, replacing the face shield is optional because it must be removed to properly position the cap and fix the chin strap. The chin straps come in several sizes, but five and seven inch are common for adult caps. Most adults who wear a medium size cap need a seven inch chin strap. Fix the chin strap so that the cap will not slide on its own as you begin positioning it where you want it. With the front elastic edge just above the eyebrows and the midline aligned with the nose. Here's where that Nasian to vertex value, half of the Nasian to Enyan distance, comes in handy. FYI, this is easier without the face shield. Measure the Nasian to vertex distance and ensure that the electrode location, the small hole in the vertex or CZ holder, is at half the distance from Nasian to Enyan. Applying gel to the cap requires some technique, and developing technique requires practice. Don't expect to do this perfectly the first time. I recommend starting by applying gel at a frontal site where the participant will feel it. Insert the syringe tip almost to the scalp and inject enough gel that you can see it squirt back out of the holder. Ask them if they felt the gel on their skin. If they say no, try again. If they say yes, move to a location at the back of the cap where you believe their hair is thickest. Try injecting gel without using the tip or the syringe to part the hair. If the participant reports that they feel the gel, you can save time by just injecting gel in a similar way at each site. If they don't feel it on the first try, this is an indication that it would be advisable to use the tip of the syringe to part the hair before injecting gel at each site. If you find that you're using more than 10 cc's for 64 channels or 5 cc's for 32, then try to use less next time. It's easy to see when you don't have enough gel but in most cases, it's hard to know when you have applied too much. At sites adjacent to DRL, too much gel can result in a noisy channel, so be especially careful at sites near DRL. DRL itself needs slightly better contact than the other electrodes to do its job. Be sure to part the hair at DRL and inject enough gel that the participant feels it, but not so much that a bridge could form with an adjacent site. Now it's time to insert the electrodes in the cap. On a 64 channel cap as shown here, the cable labeled 64A represents the left side of the head and the cable labeled 64B covers the right side. On a 32 channel cap, the 32A cable covers the whole head. On caps with more than 64 channels, alphanumeric labeling like A1 through 32, B1 through 32, C1 through 32, and so on, are typical. In most caps with more than 64 channels, each electrode ribbon covers a pie-shaped region of the head. On a 64 channel cap, it makes sense to start inserting electrodes from the back of the head first so that you're working through open space rather than working through the wires. When you handle the electrodes, try to avoid putting strain on the wire electrode junction because that is the most common failure point on the electrodes in the long run. The electrodes shown here are of the new reinforced type which are highly durable and almost never break. Because the wire near the electrode is reinforced, you will find that it makes sense to orient each electrode in its holder with the wire going toward the back where the AD box should be located. 
As you finish with each electrode cable, put the cable over the participant's left shoulder so that all the cables are in one place when you're finished. Depending on your participant population, you might also want to make the participant aware that they are responsible for keeping the cables off the floor so that you don't step on them. It is good practice to insert CMS DRL last and loop the CMS DRL cable around the rest of the active electrode cables about five times along the length of the cables to minimize interference pickup. CMS stands for common mode sense and it can be thought of as the common, somewhat like the ground. DRL stands for driven right leg. DRL has a slightly tighter threshold for contact quality to do its job of active noise reduction. Make sure you part the hair at DRL and inject enough gel, but not too much. After all of the electrodes have been applied and you've organized the cables, if you need to move the participant to a different chair, this is the time to do so. In this example, we used a high stool for electrode prep, but we will use a low stationary chair during the experiment. Roll the cart or cabinet holding the AD box into place behind the participant. Plug the electrode cables into the AD box. In this 64 channel example, the ribbon cable connector with the label ending in A goes in the A connector, and the one with the label ending in B goes in the B connector. Orientation is important. Make sure the red line on the ribbon cable is toward the left side of the AD box when you are looking at the front panel of the AD box. If you try to insert these connectors in the wrong orientation, it is possible to bend the pin on the electrode connector and or damage the connector on the AD box. Damage to the input connectors can be repaired, but this may mean lost time for your lab. CMS DRL is normally plugged in at the leftmost circular DIN input on the front panel. The individual leads, such as the flat type electrodes we placed at the mastoids, are inserted in the connectors marked EX1 through 8 on the front top edge of the AD box. Next comes a four step electrode contact check. One, blue light, meaning CM is in range. Two, low offsets, meaning all connected electrodes should have offset less than plus or minus 40 millivolts. Three, stable offsets. Offsets should be stable when you touch the wires near the participant's head. Four, no outliers. Signals are similar in size and frequency content across all channels. When you connect CMS DRL and the AD box power is on, the blue CM in range light on the front panel should illuminate if there is a good contact at these electrode sites and there are no other faults. Be aware that the blue dot on the top right side of the ActiveView screen reflects the state of the blue CM in range light on the front panel of the AD box. Even if your data acquisition computer is in another room, you will always know the state of the blue light, even if you cannot see the AD box front panel. With all of the electrodes plugged in, you can start the ActiveView software and check the electrode contacts. After opening ActiveView, click Start at the top left to start viewing the incoming signals. Click on Electrode Offsets, the third tab from the left on the top of the screen. On the Electrode Offsets tab, look for electrodes with offset greater than 40 millivolts. Note the channel labels of any out-of-range electrode contacts and go back to the head cap and remove each of these electrodes, part the hair with the syringe tip, and inject more gel, reinsert the electrodes, and check each contact as you go. Once all electrode offsets appear to be in range, look for unstable contacts. At a scale of 262 millivolts on the offsets tab, the red bar should be quite stable when you touch the wires near the head. If you see any bars that appear to balance or oscillate when you touch the wires, do the same process of removing, parting the hair, injecting gel, and reinserting the electrode at each of these sites. Now switch back over to the leftmost tab labeled monopolar at the top of the ActiveView screen. A scale between 50 and 200 millivolts per division is reasonable. 
Turn off the filters and set the reference to none raw for the most accurate representation of the data being saved to disk. ActiveView saves data without filters except the low-pass anti-aliasing filter and without an EEG reference. Reference will be chosen offline from among the channels you have saved. When you're satisfied with the quality of the data, set up the recording by clicking Start File. This will bring up a series of dialog boxes in which you will need to specify which channels to save and the file name and location. The defaults in this dialog are read from the config file, along with other ActiveView settings. It's a good idea to set defaults the way that you want the operator to see the data to ensure a consistent view of the data across recordings. Be sure to use a unique file name for each recording. One approach to naming files would be to incorporate some form of participant ID and an indication of the experiment and condition. When the low battery warning comes up for the first time, it indicates you have 20% or less of battery capacity remaining. You should still have over an hour left after this appears the first time, so it's safe to click out of this warning. After the warning, a red low battery indicator dot will appear at the top right of the screen. After the EEG recording has started, if you're doing an EP or ERP experiment, you will need to set up and start the stimulus. Often, written instructions are presented to the subject at the beginning of the experiment. Otherwise, provide verbal instructions. It is common practice to include at least a few practice trials at the beginning of the experiment. To avoid confusion during the analysis phase, it's usually best if these trials are marked with unique trigger codes so they can be distinguished from the actual experimental trials. If you are doing EP or ERP, you most likely have a trigger cable between the stimulus device or computer and the Active 2 system's trigger input port. In this example, the numeric codes along the bottom of the screen represent the type of stimulus the participant was seeing at that exact moment. The number on the top represents the value at the rising edge of the trigger code, and the number at the bottom represents the value at the falling edge. If the number on the bottom is not zero, then the port is not being returned to zero after each stimulus code. This is poor triggering practice, since analytical software that you will use to review the recorded files will have an easier time finding events of interest if the port returns to zero after each code. A feature of the ActiveView software that most users never explore is online averaging on the Average tab. In this example, we set the dialog to update two averages, one for PZ referenced to the average mastoids and another for CZ with the same reference. This average will be updated each time trig1, bit zero on the trigger port, goes high. This can be helpful in evoke potential experiments, but because the options for combining or binning sweeps are limited, this feature is not often used in ERP experiments. Note that the EMSE Data Editor Live Session feature expands significantly on this capability, allowing online EP and ERP multi-bin averaging, trending, time frequency, and frequency domain analysis, and more. During the recording, it is important not to distract the participant. If the participant is in a verified soundproof chamber with the door closed, it should be fine to have conversations between experimenters, take a phone call, etc. But don't assume the chamber is soundproof without testing it to be sure. Depending on how you have run the cables into and out of the chamber, there's probably at least a small cable pass-through or waveguide opening. And just that small opening is enough to let distracting noise into the chamber. Consider also that the participant has placed their trust in you to be there for them in case they become confused, uncomfortable, or distressed during the experiment. If conversations and phone calls are not urgent, then it's best to save them for later. Depending on the length of the experiment, you may be monitoring the recording for a while. We've heard stories of participants passing out, falling asleep, and trying to get up and remove the electrodes from their head. You can imagine how unsafe this can be if the experiment is not vigilantly monitoring the participant. In case you have no other way to monitor the participant for safety purposes, you can consider installing a video camera and an always-on mic so that the participant can let you know if they need something. 
a baby monitor is a good choice, but more advanced solutions also exist. Here we have edited the recording for brevity, but when the event codes stop coming across the bottom of the screen, you can assume the experiment has either paused or it has completed. In this case, we are finished, so we click Stop at the top left side of the screen to close the saved data file. This is important because if you pause instead of stopping, the file will remain open. If you then turn off or unplug the AD box, the file will not be properly closed. No data will be lost, but for some analysis software programs, you will need to repair the file before you can read it. The best practice is to always click Stop when the recording is finished. Next, you want to turn off the AD box and unplug all the cables from it so that you can move it out of the way. The AD box is the most expensive part of the system, so the last thing you want to happen is for it to be knocked over or for gel to be dripped on top of it. Remove the electrode ribbon cables by pressing on the white connector ejectors and unplug the EXG and CMS DRL cables by pulling firmly by the connector housing and not the cable. Move the cart or cabinet holding the AD box out of the way and let the EEG cables hang straight down from the participant, being careful not to let anyone step on them, including yourself. Pull the CMS DRL cable upward gently to free it from the rest of the cables and then remove CMS and DRL from the head cap. Ask the participant to remove the face shield and then unfasten the chin strap. Grasp the two sides of the chin strap and pull upward to remove the assembled cap from the participant's head. Remember that the mastoid electrodes are still attached to the participant, but since you removed the CMS DRL cable from around the rest of the cables, the cap and ribbon cable should come off cleanly without being tangled in the EXG cables. By holding the cap in one hand or hanging the assembled cap and electrodes around your neck, carefully remove the EXG electrodes at mastoids, earlobes, and around the eyes if you record a DOG. Grasp the electrode at the top, distal end, and pull away from the head. Remove the double-sided adhesive ring from each electrode immediately to avoid these from getting stuck to other electrode wires. Note that waiting until you begin washing the electrodes to try to remove these would be a mistake because they become very slick and hard to grasp when wet. There will be gel residue in the hair after the cap has been removed. This can be embarrassing for some participants if they have to walk through a public area after the procedure. For this reason, you should have a plan for how participants will be able to clean up after the procedure. The best case scenario is to be able to offer the use of a private bathroom with a shower or sink with spray nozzle and a clean towel to clean up afterward. Some labs encourage participants to bring a hat that they can wear when they leave in lieu of being able to provide a private area to clean up. Every situation will be different, but try to be considerate because you want participants to have a positive experience and the impressions that matter most are the first and last interactions with the lab. If you are responsible for seeing the participant off, then do that first. If you have other tasks to do after the EEG procedure that will take more than 30 minutes, consider wrapping the electrode cap and electrodes in a towel to keep the gel from drying out in the cap. Do not put the cap and or electrodes in a bucket of water at this point, because if you forget or are unable to get back to them for an extended period of time, you do not want them to soak for longer than 10 minutes in liquid. Prolonged soaking can make the electrode pellets soft and more vulnerable to damage. After taking care of the participant, begin cleaning up the cap and electrodes. You should have two plastic buckets on hand. Put a small amount of Dawn dish soap in one of them and run about a half bucket of warm soapy water. The temperature should be tolerable to the hand. This will be for washing the cap after you remove the electrodes. With the electrode cables draped over your shoulders, remove the electrodes one at a time from the cap. Grasp each electrode by the sides of the electrode head. Avoid putting pressure on the wire electrode junction. While grasping the electrode, instead of trying to pull it out of the cap immediately, first begin rotating the head slightly in the holder until you find that it begins to come out of the holder on its own. Let each electrode drape gently down as you move on to the next. Once all of the electrodes have been removed, you can submerge the cap in soapy water. Remember that soap is fine for the cap, but it is not recommended for the electrodes because it can accelerate the loss of chloride from the electrode pellets. 
Fluoride is what makes the electrodes an efficient ion pump, so you should be mindful at every step that maintaining the chloride in the pellets will extend their service life. Run another bucket of warm water, but this time without any soap. This is for washing the electrodes. The warmer the water, the better, but remember that the water should be tolerable to the hand and not scalding hot. Take one set of 32 pin-type electrodes at a time and grasp the cable a couple of inches from the electrode heads. Swish the electrode heads in the warm water for about 30 seconds to a minute. That should be enough to remove any gel and hair from the electrodes. After washing, towel dry the electrodes and set them aside. Be careful to find a location where the electrodes will be safe from being crushed or stepped on and avoid putting the electrode tips near any metal. The tips of the electrodes are pure silver silver chloride and they will corrode or oxidize easily if they rest against another incompatible metal for more than a few minutes. The procedure used to wash the pentype electrodes on ribbon cables will work fine for the pentype CMS DRL and pentype EXG electrodes, but it will not be effective for the flat type electrodes. It's helpful to have either a spray head faucet or a cotton swab to remove the gel from the crevice around the edge of the electrode contact. A soft brush can be used too, but be very cautious because the electrode material is soft and can be removed by regular brushing. Now it is time to return to the cap, which has been soaking for a few minutes in warm soapy water. The gel should be well dissolved by now and it should be easy to wash away. The spray head faucet can be very useful in washing the cap since it helps to break the surface tension of the viscous gel, aiding in its removal. Wash the cap inside out first and then rinse and inspect the outside of the cap. Keep repeating the process until you see no more evidence of gel in the electrode holders or on the fabric between the holders. Finally, run one more bucket of clean water and thoroughly rinse the soap out of the cap. Then towel dry the cap, removing the majority of the water from it to prepare for disinfection. Consider that water in the cap may dilute whatever disinfectant solution you choose to use and that can make it less effective. Our high speed cap dryer can fully dry a cap in as little as three minutes. So consider that optional accessory if you want to ensure the effectiveness of your disinfectant solution. Numerous disinfectant solutions exist, but in the era of COVID-19, many of them are hard to get. Be sure that whatever disinfectant you choose is both effective against the pathogens you are most concerned about and safe for use on the caps and electrodes. We are only able to judge the safety of disinfectants we have experience with, so if you use a disinfectant that we do not recommend, investigate the chemical composition and consider the effect that the chemical components of the solution will have on the materials, including plastics, elastic fabric, and pure electrode metals. Also consider that every disinfectant has a prescribed kill time for each pathogen for which it has been tested. So be sure to leave the disinfectant on the cap and electrodes long enough to meet the minimum requirements for the pathogens of concern. After a suitable amount of time has passed, rinse the electrodes and cap again and towel dry. At this point, the electrodes are ready to be used again. It's no problem to use them again when slightly wet. The cap cannot be used again while wet. To dry the cap, you can lay it flat on a towel or place it on a head frame drying stand to air dry in a few hours. Or you can use the high speed cap dryer to dry it in three to five minutes so that you can use the cap again almost immediately. That's it, now go practice. There's no better way to cement these lessons than practice. Plan to make practice recordings on your friends and colleagues rather than practicing on critical experimental participants. One tip about practice, this is the time to make mistakes. So go forward gently and with caution, but don't be surprised if something doesn't work right the first time. There are a lot of steps that have to be taken in the right way and in the right order. And one small error can make a critical difference in whether your experimental data are reliable and valid. You will make mistakes, so plan to make those mistakes during practice recordings so that your experiments will all go perfectly later. 
Thank you for your time and attention. Happy experimenting. <laughs>